is our text, the words of the Gentile Syrophoenician woman begging Jesus to cast the demon out of her daughter. Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. He said to her, for this statement, you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. She went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the fellow disciples of Concordia. This morning, I have to say, the song and hymn that we just read was titled, O Son of God in Galilee, You Made the Deaf to Hear, the Mute to Speak, uses the same word from the Gospel about Ephatha. What's ironic is the title is wrong. It doesn't go with today's gospel. Because today is all about body language. Jesus did not perform the miracles this morning that are recorded anywhere near Galilee. To try to point this out, I asked Wayne if he could put a map up for us. And I brought my ruler from home. There we go. I won't, be, I, won't be, I won't touch. I won't touch. <laughs> the text starts out, Jesus left from that Capernaum area right there and headed out towards the region of Syrophoenicia, Tyre, about this area. Now, you've got to understand, that's 55 miles out of the Promised Land. In the midst of Gentiles who were nothing but pagans historically, going back even before Israel invaded the land. There he performed the healing of casting out the demon for the woman of faith. It then says Jesus went on to Sidon, away further, turned around, and went back towards. Galilee and all the way over to the Decapolis. Again, what I'm saying is he wasn't anywhere close to home, the old stomping grounds. He's off into foreign lands, Gentiles, pagans, Syrophoenician, Canaanites. And over here, he's in the midst of the Greek Roman cities and all of their pagan polytheistic worship. Here in these two different places, the Lord performs his miracles. And again, I say, the point is body language. Jesus has not taken some vacation off to some club bed beach. And he's not just meandering around. Again, understand, 55 miles out of his to go over there, and then another 125 or 30 to go back over to the Decapolis. That's about three days' journey this way, and about five this way. All in a quest so he can manifest just how far God with us, himself incarnate will graciously go as to reveal God's merciful and loving presence, to be with those whose consciences are weighed down with fearful doubts about God's forgiving love and suffering lonely uncertainties as to God's merciful companionship. God's going out of his way, literally, to be with them. The skepticism you would expect to be there in this Syrophoenician mother whose daughter is possessed by an unclean spirit. At first she seems hindered by God's word incarnate, trying to go incognito. But the promise gets out. He who bears in his person's flesh and blood, bringing God's merciful kingdom, has drawn near to her. And she sees this as an opportunity she can't pass up. Most likely, let us understand, there's nothing miraculous that somehow or other just fell out of the sky. This is Mark 7. Back in Mark 3, Jesus' fame in his career early was such that it records there people from Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem, and as far 
away as distant Tyre and Sidon were coming to him. Apparently, she couldn't make the trip then. Yet even the bit of good news and hearing about God with his people there was enough to plant faith in her heart from out of which springs a joyous expectation. He's come to me all this way just to be with me. Our faith is similar, similarly inspired by the news of God's Son come all the way from heaven. Every Christmas, born in the humble, lowly surroundings of a major in some Bethlehem stable, God with us, establishing God's baptismal appointment of him being with us as his beloved children, Jesus anointed in the Jordan River with the Holy Spirit, and God's approving presence for all the days of his life on this earth. However humble or low it may be, God is with you. Yet, we all have to admit, there are days when God with us seems like a promise, less like a promise, and more like a teaser. God close, yeah, but there are days when our lives are not going well, materially, financially, or emotionally, or bodily, and it seems like God's kind of keeping his distance, holding back. Such is our lives always susceptible to the common problems of this world. Jesus seems to be taunting the woman's faith in him, and that's a little bit unnerving when he responds, well, I, I gotta go to the other people first because I can't cast bread to the dogs. He's impugning her Canaanite pedigree by all Mosaic standards and Jewish practices, such as disqualified her as meriting God with us attention. It may sound like just a crude joke, but there is Old Testament history at work here. There's an even deeper insult. 800 years earlier, King Ahab of Israel married the ruler of Tyre and Sidon, a princess daughter, to form a political alliance. And she, having been married, <laughs> brought to the capital of Israel her own worship, building all kinds of idolatrous temples and stocking them with thousands and thousands of priests. And then using her monarch, mon monarchical sway to induce the rest of the nation to join her. Her name has become synonymous with all things defiled. Jezebel. The infamy of this she-devil and her faith at putting God's people through all of this was foretold by the prophet Elisha. For all of her notorious wickedness, Jezebel would one day die at the hands of her husband's usurper. And the gruesome kicker was, dogs would eat her on very body. Indeed, after being killed, Jezebel ended up eaten by ravenous hounds, so that all that remained, and this is in the scriptures, was her hands, her feet, and some skull. So when Jesus says, we, I can't cast the children's bread to dogs, the implication is, you're just a Jezebel. God with her? If he is, he's certainly not very kind or very empathetic, as measured by Jesus' off-putting remark. And so, how often is this poor woman's experience a reflection of our own everyday life? Our sinful nature, spiritually digests our worldly plights and interprets them as God's way of giving us the cold shoulder and acting with drama. Our continued sufferings tempt our old Adam and Eve luring our conscience to hear God with us as some sort of diss, because we're still looking rather common, ordinary, unworthy of His loving time and effort. <coughs> 
And, you know, sometimes we say, well, you know, it's only temporary. God's just kind of, you know, teasing us, stringing us along a little bit. But that won't quell the fleshly craving of sapping our faith and expectation of God graciously and mercifully being with us. Because eventually it's all going to flare up and we're going to lash out. God, you're not taking our situation seriously. It's maybe a lame attempt at your sense of humor, but it's humiliating at our expense. God with us, what a joke. What a laugh. Yet something mysterious happens in the life and heart of this mother. She is not put off by Jesus' off-putting comment. On the contrary, her trust in Jesus, promising God's loving presence, moves her to an intensity of faith that crucifies those bitter feelings. Jesus is here. He didn't walk away from me. He didn't just leave me. He's still sitting there, and that is where my hope is placed. Putting to death my sinful de desire to throw back some bitter, rancorous reprimand in his face. Jesus' body language of staying, remaining, abiding, maintained her a dogged faith and a determined expectation. He had more than enough divine grace and heavenly mercy to help her daughter. So freed up with that lively faith and laid back hope in Jesus, she makes her own little lighthearted profession. Lord, I trust you are God with me. As God, you've got more than enough, even leftover grace and mercy, however meager a meal it might be. It'll be enough. For my soul to feast upon your affectionate, kindly presence that will offer me and my daughter new life and salvation from the past. That faith, that expectation, Jesus does not hesitate, he does not delay. He throws out all the mosaic rules and all the centuries of man-made prejudices and blesses her faith and her hope in him, God, with us, releasing her daughter from the evil one's grip. Dear baptized children of the Heavenly Father, so born of the promised Holy Spirit, adopting us as his beloved people. However harshly this world judges our outward appearances, God with us is something he takes seriously enough to go all the way to be with us, even if it takes him to the cross and that he suffered death in order to uphold his promise. Jesus walked 55 miles to get to this Canaanite lady in the pagan area of Syrophoenicia. He'll go to Calvary and his grave to maintain the covenant that God will never abandon or separate himself from us. That crucified faith grants us the ability to stand up to any concupiscent feelings in our hearts that God has somehow given us the cold shoulder or distancing ourselves from him. We can deal with the realities of seemingly world rejection. Sometimes even God seems indeed to have taken a step back. Yet we hold on because of Christ's cross holding on to us. That is no joke. When it comes to lovingly being with us, God is as serious as a heart attack, and that sincerity can only be measured by his willingness to die, and then the victory of him rising again from the grave. His promise is nothing to laugh at, but it does give us cause to rejoice. When that cross and open tomb alone is the foundation of God promising and willing to be with us and us to be with him. When it comes to sin, death, or even the devil himself, we and God have the last laugh on them all. Christ is God's promise. No amount of time, no kind of space is ever going to defile us that God would separate us from his gracious and merciful presence. With smiling defiance, we can tell our somewhat crumbling consciences, yeah, I may look like a sinner like all the rest of the people in this world, 
but God's crucified and risen Son has planted such faith and hope in Him being with me that I can joyfully confess, trust, and expect. Kind of like the woman. There's still a place for me at your table, Lord. Bingo. We celebrate that, however crummy life may get. Jesus has given us a standing reservation to feast on the meal of his real presence. Incarnate, crucified, risen, and now glorified. We eat and drink, not just a nostalgic memory, memory to go back, but in the joyful realization of the present. He is with us in, with, and under that bread and wine. He fortifies our faith. He feeds our hope and fires up our loyalty to joyfully proclaim, God remains abiding in my heart. He keeps on dwelling in the midst of my baptized family of Concordia, embodying this membership. We are his living hands, feet, and voices. We bring God's kingdom of grace and mercy to others. Put <laughs> the world laugh. <coughs> we can die laughing. As plain old ordinary sinners, yet living by faith in commonplace situations, enduring crummy times, crumbling circumstances. Yet in the midst of all this, our confidence in God with us on account of Jesus Christ only nourishes our determination to speak up and act out as his genuine disciples and authenticate all of that by taking up our crosses of sacrificial service in his name for others. We be fed by the feast of his gracious and merciful presence this morning that Jesus may embolden us to passionately pursue our apostolic appointments for this week, sharing the good news of God with others. Jesus went five days and 150 miles to heal the deaf mute in the Decapolis. Wondrously, he uses word and sacrament today to come to us and grant us a hands-on experience. He puts his promises into our ears puts his presence on the tip of our tongues and loosens up our lives from any grip of worry or fear with the confidence God is with us. <laughs> and so there's the rub. Healed by this real presence, his spiritual cure for our hearts can bear the same fruitful, wondrous results, liberating our hearts and minds and our lives. How far will we go, joyously telling others in our words and deeds, they can have Jesus in their hearts? Sure. And what he gives them is God with them. Every Faith and hope in Jesus Christ is grounded upon the trust and anticipation God will be with us in our journey throughout this world. Wherever we go, however the situations, celebrate this promise of Christ crucified and raised. He will uphold the promise of God with us and realizing how far that faith and hope and loyalty is what makes our journey through this world one we can take all the way through every day every moment god's grace and mercy will take us even to life everlasting amen the peace of God which surpasses all human understanding, keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen.